Hello, and you're very welcome to episode 26 of the Attic Sessions. Um, great to be back and in very good company once again. We have been joined by the journalist, author, Martina Devlin. Martina, thanks for coming in. To Pleasure talk to, to be us. here. Um, and we're going to talk about your latest book, which is The Truth and Dare in, in a little while. But I thought it would be great to, to talk to you about how the whole writing journey started, how, how you got into it. So, you know, as a kid, were you always scribbling or? How yes, did you yes. I used to write little books as a child. I'd get notebooks. I still have one of them and I'd write endlessly long, complicated stories. Uh, all sorts, detection, and I suppose there were sort of Sabina Blyton in some ways, but there was no ginger pop and um, and that funny food um, that uh, they, they used oh, to read in Oh, those Blyton. wonderful little sort of snacks and, and, and yes. things that they brought. So were you yes. sort of surrounded by books and you were responding to what you were reading? Well, there were books, but books were very expensive when I was a child. Um, but we used to go to the library a lot. I mean, we did have books in the house as well. Yeah. Um, but one of my happiest early memories is of being taken to the library as a little girl, maybe about five by my father. Yeah. And it was one of those moments really that affect the rest of your life. I remember he was a bus driver. I remember he came home from work early one day and he said he was taking me out somewhere. And I'm from a big family, so yeah. you didn't get very much one-on-one -on -one time. Yeah. So it was just the two of us. And he popped me on the bar of his bike. And I remember we cycled past <coughs> my big brother's school and we didn't stop there. We cycled past the Gormley's newspaper shop where he always got his evening press, uh, didn't stop there. And then we arrived at a building that I hadn't noticed before in the center of the town and from Oma. Mm -hmm. And, um, in we went, and I remember the smell. There was this musty, fusty smell. And he brought me over to the children's section, it was the library, yeah. and left me there. And he went off to uh, look at his Morris Walsh's and the books he used to read. And I had a lovely, lovely time reading a book yeah. about a rabbit. Uh -huh. um, and he came back before I'd finished it. And I thought, he said, we have to go now. And I thought, I'll never find out what happens. Um, but he said, no, no, bring it with you um, and choose another. Yeah. And he brought me up to the desk. We checked the book out and he had joined me up as a member. And I can still taste the amazement of discovering that you could borrow a book, read it, bring it back and borrow another. Yeah. I think it's one of the society's greatest gifts to the and, rest of and us. And there's no shortage of stories. There, there, there will always be stories that people have written that you can access in worlds that you're discovering for the first time. That's right, but finance isn't a barrier to this voyage of discovery. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, books are a lot less expensive nowadays. The idea of books in charity shops for 50 cent or a euro didn't exist sure. when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, but just you can go anywhere in the world where there's a public library and you feel instantly at home. Yeah. I'll always pop into the library, whichever new town I'm in. Yeah. So so in school, were you sort of harboring this, this sense that I want, I'm going to write stories like the stories I've been reading in the library, or were you told to set that aside because you had to study hard and be a sensible accountant or something? Or <laughs> what, what was the... Nobody thought of me as a sensible accountant, I don't think. I mean, I think I grew up with a storytelling tradition. Yeah. Both my mother and father told stories. And I believe that uh, it's partly because we took a lot of long car journeys when I was a child. Um, my mother's from Oula in County Limerick. My father's from Oma in Tyrone, where I grew up. And my memory of childhood is these lengthy, lengthy car journeys yeah. um, from the north to the south. Yeah. And my parents told stories during them. Yeah. Um, my mother was a great one for ghost stories. Ah. My father loved traditional legends. Mm, he had a great interest and pride in Celtic heritage. Yeah. So 
I just, it was just normal for us to tell stories. I mean, at Halloween we did it a lot too. At Christmas, the tradition of uh, uh, the ghost story on Christmas Eve was strong mm. in our family. It was just very much that mm. storytelling tradition. So I knew I always wanted to tell stories in some shape or form. But I had also to earn a living. Mm. And I guess I didn't think you could be a writer as a job. Uh, certainly as a child, that didn't occur to me, yeah. though I did write stories. Yeah. Um, so did journalism... Took that place. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Journalism was a way of using words, telling stories, meeting people and interacting with them, yeah. um, but also earning a living. So did you first work in a local newspaper and then, because I know you were in Fleet Street for a number of years, yes. so is that how it worked? What happened is um, I, um, I trained as a journalist in England and um, I worked on local and daily papers in England. For the longest period I worked on the Press Association, which is a news agency, uh, agency yes. Yeah. Um, and. Um, I really liked it. It was on Fleet Street. Um, I stayed a bit longer, perhaps, than you know, uh, if if I were thinking about a career, I ought to have. But I did a degree while I was uh, full t while I was working at um, on the Press Association. Mm -hmm. I did a degree as well yeah. um, at Birkbeck College in London because I dropped out. I'd um, been studying law and had dropped out. I didn't like law because of precedent. I didn't like when you asked a question, the answer was always precedent. Okay. That, you know, does there is not no compute. new way of thinking about things. It's well, just the way it's been done before. Yeah, exactly. That was my take on it. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a place for precedent as well. Yeah. So um, I dropped out and hadn't finished my degree. And um, I, th I thought that that was a mistake. So yeah. at the Press Association, there were very they were very kind to me really and seemed to be reasonably willing to keep me so I used to clear off for lectures and things. And, and what, what were you, was it law still English or literature. English literature? Yeah. So, um, so I stayed there till I finished the degree and a bit longer not to be ungrateful. And was the experience that I uh, had in UCD in the 80s of studying dead male writers as opposed to contemporary living women writers? Was Did you notice that? I su I suppose um, I was so busy like working full time in the press association and trying to be a student as and well that in. I didn't get my essays in, that I yeah. didn't um, really get up on my feminist high horse perhaps as much as I would now. Yeah. But, um, and, and as well, there were a lot of women writers that we yeah. studied, like the Brontes, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they were very big on the Brontes. Yeah. And in fairness, my, my feminist high horse is very retrospective. I was certainly yeah. not thinking about that in the 80s. Yeah. I just took what I was given and, and, and studied. But it is... It helps you to think, though. Yeah. And, and perhaps you are somewhere under the surface. It is. I think it was more when I moved to Ireland that I became conscious of it. You know, the famous poster with all these... Male, male writers, writers. Yeah. Um, and I did start hunting out yeah. female writers as well, yeah. probably beginning with dead ones, for example Elizabeth Bowen, yeah. I think she's an extraordinary writer, yeah. Yeah. Um, but then you discover that there are amazing living writers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly we, we, we've, we've had discussions on, on this program in the past with uh, Maria McManus for example in, in Northern Ireland talking about the, the sort of the the dearth of female role models in Ulster writing. Well, you see, I would disagree. Yeah, because coming from Oma, um, I was aware of Alice Milligan. Ah, who, who you write about in here. Yes, yeah. um, she's not as well known as she should be. Yeah. But I grew up knowing yeah. about this figure. My father spoke about her. Um, then another well-known Oma writer, Benedict Kiley, wrote about her too. We were very conscious of her. We learned her poetry in mm. school. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was a little girl in the garden playing, a thing was often said to chide us delaying. And then there's another bit. And then, come in for it's growing late and the grass will wet you. Come in or when it's dark, the finions will get mm. you. And she talks about how, as a little girl, she wanted to be a finion and run away with them. Yeah, I, I knew I knew about women writers growing S up in Oma. So you didn't have a sense that it was an obstacle being a woman? No, I never had that sense. Uh, I'm I'm one of seven, five brothers and two sisters. Yeah. And I didn't think of myself as other from the boys, really. We just all messed about together. Yeah. So so was it back in Ireland that you began to write creative writing, if we can 
I Probably didn't do any creative writing in England at yeah. all. Um, I find journalism compelling and I had a very interesting journalistic career. Yeah. I met extraordinary people. But looking back, I can see that I was always inclined to go off and interview writers if at all possible. And I did meet some very interesting writers that way. So clearly, although I hadn't rationalized it, I was very interested in them and what they were doing. Yeah. I remember I interviewed Anthony Burgess well, several times yeah. uh, and we'd always talk about Clockwork Orange yeah. and uh, he never regretted taking it, withdrawing it from publication yeah. because of the violence yeah. associated with it. Yeah. Very interesting erudite man. I mean, I met amazing people. I met Reggie Cray. I was sent to Parkhurst Maximum Security Prison to interview him. Uh, obviously, I didn't pitch up as a journalist because journalists weren't allowed in for that. I was yeah. somehow passed off as a, a friend or relative. And that was amazing. Did he have a really strong charisma? Oh, <laughs> big time. He was also instantly recognisable because of the iconic black and white yeah, photographs, photographs, David Bailey photographs yeah. of him. And although he'd been in prison for a good number of years at this stage, he obviously still worked out and was very fit. Yeah. Um, uh, I remember a very strong smell of tobacco from him as well. Clearly yeah. that was one of his few uh, ways of passing in the time. And but all, all those sensory impressions are the sort of things that you make use of in your in your creative writing, if you say. If well, you like. possibly. I guess it was a learning. I guess yeah. it was an apprenticeship yeah. that I wasn't particularly conscious of. I've yeah. never plotted anything out in yeah. life. I, yeah. I seem to stumble from one thing to the next. I don't even know what a, ne a next book will be. Yeah. And in, f in fact, if you look at my um, publishing history, it's... It's quite varied. Yeah. I don't do, you know, if I've had a success with one type of book, I don't, don't do, do it, it again. again. Yeah. In fact, I deliberately try not to. I'm a great believer that the writer, I didn't say this, but I've registered it, that the writer should be a moving target. Yeah. Um, or an, I suppose another way of thinking about it is that if you don't change you're not only standing still, you're going backwards. Yes, well, no, absolutely. And learning just the sense of sort of having something new to learn as well as is, is, is a great impetus. I don't think publishers like this particularly, though. They yeah. want you to do the same as your last book, only slightly different. So yeah. people don't quite know what yeah. to make of me. Yeah. Um, I see here on my wonderful list of questions, which we may or may not get through at all, 96 seems to have been a pivotal year because you won a Hennessy Award. Yes, and it was at that point that I thought perhaps I'll do creative writing. Um, but it still took me a little while. Yeah. Um, was that sort of an affirmation? Yes, exactly. Important? That made you think, OK, perhaps I can do this. I mean, I knew I could do journalism. I yeah. knew I was interested in people. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't know if I could make up people. Yeah. If, although I suppose, look, I always lived in my imagination too yeah. from when I was a little girl. I mean, I remember lying in bed trying to get to sleep by telling myself stories. So so did, did was there also a sense of, of being liberated from fact? Yes. Yes. I treat facts with extreme care, I hope, um, and I'm respectful of them. So it's very important to me to be clear when I'm working in fact yeah. and when I'm working in fiction. Yeah. And of course, I've now broken my own rules by truth and dare because I'm blending fact and fiction. I mean, for example, if you look at the back of any of the historical novels I've written, I'm always quite clear. I do an author's note yeah. and I explain where I've deviated. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that if, if there is a statement of method of some sort, so, so that, you know, you are being sort of clear with the reader out, okay, this is based in fact, these are invented, you know, and, and the story lies somewhere in between the invention and, and, and the factual area. The reader at least knows sure. where they stand because you've given them that guide. I mean, perhaps you don't have to. I know some writers believe that, you know, the fact that it's a novel, people have to just go yeah. along with that. Yeah. But because of my background in fact um, and journalism, I feel it's important to yeah. lay out my store. And look, you can do it and st people will still be um, 
still not take it on board. I mean, so at the beginning of um, my novel about the the seventeen eleven witchcraft trials in Island McGee, the house where it happened. That's right. I have a, a section where um, seventy years earlier, someone observes a massacre happen, and she writes a letter to her husband about it, and. As part of the creative process, I pretend that the letter, uh, one of the pages is lost, so it ends in mid-sentence. Yes. And I then have a, a little writerly conceit that this is a, an, a, an excerpt from a letter the Bell Collection held in the Linen Hall Library. It's all made up, yeah. hand on my heart. I tell people it's made up at the back of the book, but the Linen Hall Library has told me they've had people ringing in up looking for asking to see the Bell Collection. <laughs> <laughs> or they email me and tell me that they're going in to see the, that they've been in to see the Bell Collection or, you know. Well, if they've actually seen it, that's even, even well, more Well, no, what they do <laughs> is they say, um, do the Linen Hall Library know that you're claiming yeah. It holds the Bell Collection and are you allowed to do this? Yeah. And I always write back very politely and say it's fiction, it's novel, but I do say in the author's note it's made up. So obviously not everybody reads the author's yeah, note. I, I, I think that's quite, quite I possible. I love an author's yeah. note. It's often the first thing I'll make a beeline yeah, for. Yeah, me too. I mean, I think it is, it does give you, I feel anxious if I'm unsure about the status of a text, I think. Okay. So if I have that uh, information in advance, I know how to take things. Mm. Um, and it's funny because you're reminding me that I, I, I think the second poetry collection of mine included an entirely fabricated correspondence and, and journal of my grandmother oh, nice. set during the Civil yeah. War. Yeah. And some review somewhere said, well, you know, really, I think the most interesting part of that what were the letters. So why didn't you just, you know, <laughs> publish the letters? And it's because like, I made the whole thing up. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's interesting how people take things. So, so we're kind of focusing now really on, on the historic writing that, that you've been doing. And uh, you mentioned the house where it happened. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, because it was so much grounded in, in, in Island McGee, which is this beautiful part of County Antrim. Um, you know, a, a community where I suspect people, generations of people have been living. So so there might be ancestral memory sure. of the things that you were writing in about. How do you chart that, um, what could be sort of contentious territory as to your version of events and how it's remembered locally? Well, I spent some time in Island McGee researching the story and people didn't really want to talk about it. There was a sense of, why are you digging this up? That was a long time ago. Now, local historians were brilliant and very helpful, um, but people with an association, I guess, with the witchcraft trial really were not comfortable and mm. I, I still sometimes sense that mm. when I'm there there's an ambivalence about it um, partly because it's quite a religious area and sometimes people have said things to me like how do we know they weren't witches yeah yeah and I have to respect that yeah uh, so I, belief I, systems haven't necessarily changed. Not, not evolved as yeah. much as you might hope. Yeah. I mean, I'm still attempting to get some kind of memorial put up there to the women because I believe they were the victim of an injustice, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. even by the standards of the time, mm. because they never said they never pleaded guilty and the evidence against them was one person's uncorroborated word. So I don't feel that they necessarily got a fair trial, even by the standards yeah. of the day. People are uh, some people are uneasy about it. Now, equally, others are fascinated by the story, yeah. and you know, I do go and give talks there. Yeah. Um, of course, I've fictionalized the story. Yes. You know, there were two distinct happenings in Island McGee. One was a massacre of the McGees. Uh, the other then was the witchcraft yeah. trial almost 70 years later, yeah. and I've conflated the two. Yeah. I've, I've seen a link between yeah. the two. Which There's doesn't exist. No, yeah. there is yeah. no link yeah. between the two, but the writer in me thought this yeah. material has to have a bearing on my story. Yeah, 
But it, it's interesting, and, and, and again, I mean, I think we are going to see increasingly as the years go on through this decade of commemoration and uh, we get closer to, for example, 2020, 2021, 2022, when we're in a very contentious mm. period of Irish history, where immediately after the events of, say, the Civil War or the War of Independence, the instinct was to say nothing, because mm. that was the Irish way of sort of dealing with trauma of, you know, just don't, don't accept that it happened. But that the, the role of the storyteller to, to actually bring events out into the air and write them and talk about them is going to be really important because it'll give almost permission for people to start acknowledging and talking about things that, that were sources of silence for so long. Well, and some people have been silent reluctantly, you see. I have had contact from women usually who say, I think I'm descended from one of the Island McGee witches. Uh, you know, it's our family name. Yeah. My mother used to say something about it, but then yeah. go quiet. Yeah. Um, and actually, I want to reclaim this person. Yeah. I'm proud of having her yeah. in my family background. Yeah. So what's shameful 100 years ago or 300 years ago is no longer shameful yeah. today. And I've always wanted to tell these stories because every age has its witches. We mm. just call them by Di different, different names. names. The other, whatever yeah, the it's other othering. is. Yeah. 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 And it's also, it's just very interesting historically, yeah. the mindset. I mean, in some ways, w what you're doing as a fiction writer with historical material is an act of ventriloquism. Yeah. The past is never knowable, though. It's your best guess. None of us can really say, hand on our heart, that we have recreated a previous historical sure. period. Yeah. And it was for that reason that I also then decided to write a book set in the future, a dystopian novel. Sisterland. About Sisterland, about Sisterland. Yeah. I had to put in another word because somebody else had oh, written a book called it Sisterland. Oh, I was go. so annoyed. Yeah. Um, because it, oh, the whole time I was writing it, I called it Sisterland. So because the place is called Sisterland. So this is a, an example of you going in another direction and not wanting to repeat what you had just done. Partly that, but also was an experiment for me. Uh, I came up with a theory that the future is as unknowable as the past and that there was a link between the two. Yeah. It's an imagined space. Yeah. And OK, you might think that there are more signposts for the past because you can read diaries and yeah. letters and history do research. books. Yeah. Yeah. But you can do research into the future as well, into how people think that technology will work, how the kind of circumstances people will live in. Yeah. You know, there is research you can do. You don't have to go along with all the theories. Yeah, it's it's interesting you're, you're saying that because I, we watched, we recorded the, and I can't remember the title of it, the man behind the camera might remember, the, the TV show about um, the um, attempt to send a manned flight to Mars. Sean Penn is in it. Oh, I watched that last week. Yes, but what I really liked was how all that technology was shown so naturally that yes. he was talking at the television. But it wasn't mega technology. No, it, it was, was quite a, a modest yeah, advance. Yeah, and it felt very natural and and just yes, this is probably what it is going to be like to to have devices that anticipate and do things for you and, and, and whatever. So to um, me, that was like the past, too. You yeah. know, I researched a period. I thought, this is how I imagine it will be. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the story, whether you set it in 1711 or 20, you know, yeah. the 22nd century. Yeah. It's still about the people and the dilemma. Yeah. And people acting like humans and, yes. and all of those emotions that and jealousies. That fundamentally and change. Yeah. So so the most recent book, which is The, the, the Truth and Dare, was there an element, and it's 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 uh, specifically about real women uh, who played important roles in Irish history uh, and Irish literature. Was there an element, as with Alice Milligan, and there is a story about Alice Milligan in Truth and Dare, that you wanted to reclaim some aspect of, of them? Yes, I felt they'd been forgotten, submerged, sidelined, 
uh, or reduced to two-dimensional figures. Because yeah. some of them are remembered. They aren't all forgotten. We all remember Countess Markievicz, for example. But we just remember her in relation to being a 1916 revolutionary who is uh, condemned to death and then reprieved because she's a woman. Yeah. Um, I'm always and a muse of William Butler Yeats. So, so the a bit, yeah. although it was more her sister. Her sister was the gazelle, wasn't she, oh. Eva? But yes, yeah. they were both yeah. um, muses, you're right. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to bring these women back to life yeah. um, because we're walking in their footsteps, although they've left, and they've left their footprints on Irish life, but we're not necessarily conscious of them. And I felt that that does us all a disservice. Mm, mm -hmm. It warps the history we receive. Yeah. Um, but also these women should be remembered. Yeah. And, and again, in your, your very helpful introduction, <laughs> you, you, you talk about the extent to which you fictionalized or actually based things on a real incident. So, so your story about, uh, your wonderful story about Constant Mar Markievicz, we know actually the events did happen. Um, but in the case of others, as in, I think, in the, the, the story about uh, Violet Ross of, of uh, Somerville and Ross, this was just an imagined experience. So, so how did you decide when to fictionalise, when to draw from, from fact? Well, I suppose it's a bit like method acting. What I did is I immersed myself in each of the women, read their diaries, their letters. If they were writers, I read their work. Um, and I tried to get to know as much about them as possible to get under their, squ their skin. And mm -hmm. then it's like an act of ventriloquism mm. because all the stories are either first person or very close third person. It's all through the woman's perspective. Yeah. So. Um, that's what I did. I, I and then I did take some. In some cases, I took some actual incidents from their lives and wrote about them. But I wanted to fictionalize them because it was a way of humanizing them. Some of these women achieved so many extraordinary things that it could almost become a shopping list of their accomplishments, and yeah. that could be intimidating. And I wanted to be free to step inside their head, yeah. which you count as a biographer. Yeah. But I also wanted to show them when they're vulnerable, when they're unsure, when they're indecisive. Yeah. Not when they're trailing clouds of glory. It's when they're just real women. Yes. Yeah. Yes, with all the doubts and fears. And and not just not just an appendage of somebody else. So for example, Speranza is here. And so often she's described as well Oscar Wilde's mother. Well, that was the thing about so many of them. Again, it was one of the reasons I wrote about these women. Often, if they were remembered at all, it's as the wife of, sister of, daughter yeah. of, lover of. Yeah. Um, when they achieved exceptional things in their own right. Yeah. Um, Speranza, very interesting woman. Um, Jane Lady Wilde, she wrote rousing verse for the nation. Mm -hmm. She edited the nation newspaper for a while when its editor, uh, Gavin Duffy, was, was forced abroad. Yeah. Um, she did pioneering journalism. She um, championed the rational dress movement, which is all but forgotten now. But we have pockets in our clothes because of women who said rational dress is the way forward. Why should we wear clothes that you can't breathe yeah. in, that you can't move about freely? Corsets and, and hoops and things, yeah. All of that. Um, she uh, invited a well-known suffrage campaigner to speak at one of her salons in Marion Square in Dublin. She wrote about the need for a women's university mm -hmm. because there were issues over whether men and women could be educated together. Mm -hmm. So that was her solution. Mm -hmm. I think she made a, 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 an enormous contribution. Mm. But as you say, it's as Oscar Wilde's mother that she's remembered, if at all. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Anna Parnell, I suppose, in the same way, you know, Charles's younger sister. She was her younger, younger sister, sister, yes. Yeah. Anna Parnell, very, very interesting, complicated woman. Um, and of course, she wrote her own account of the land war, uh, but it wasn't published until many decades after her death. Tale of a Great Sham, and that tells you what she believed, you know, her yeah. view of the land war. Yeah. She set up the first women's political organisation and ran it um, with more verve and radicalism mm. than Charles Stuart Parnell showed mm. in his r political role. Mm. Uh, it only operated between 1880 and 82, but it had a huge knock-on effect. It influenced Common Naman and 
in Indian Aherin yeah. organizations like that. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to tell her story, but I didn't actually go into the land war to tell it. I had her a bit later uh, when she's struggling to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. uh, she's in London trying to get her journalism placed. She's also working at her art. And mm -hmm. it was quite a sad postscript to her life, well, a long postscript. Yeah. But I think that with many of these women, it was one day as a tiger. Yeah, yeah. The, the rising to the occasion yes, when and, needed. Yes, and putting up with all the mess and yeah. unpleasantness that yeah. came afterwards. Yeah. And I believe that many of them, if they had to do it again, would. You know, you see, often they were battling against their families as well as society when they were saying things like, we should have access to education, we should have access to the professions, we should have access to the vote, which is the cornerstone of democracy, yeah. we should have autonomy over our lives. Yeah. And you had other men and women saying, but sure, why would you even want self-determination when you've got brothers and fathers and husbands who look after you. you yeah. know, the idea of self-respect didn't come into it. Yeah. And with some of these women, for example, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, who was a suffragette who was jailed on four occasions, went on hunger strike at least three times. I don't think she did it on the fourth mm -hmm. um, prison term. Um, you know, sh she struggled for decades against this um, I suppose patriarchy is the mm. only word to use for it, uh, but it affected working class men too. It didn't just affect women. She struggled, but she kept going. She set up a women's party. Women didn't vote for them. Yeah. So and I think that perhaps what we're seeing today and what we can learn from them is that if women work together and chip away at injustice, they can make a difference, yeah. even if it's only baby steps. Alice Milligan believed that you have to work as hard for something as if it's only just around the corner, even yeah. though in your heart, you know, you'll never live to yeah. see it. But you still have to have, have, to that, have that faith yeah. and perseverance. And yeah. that's what we can learn yeah. from them. It's what they learned from each other. I mean, the women who came after knew about Anna Parnell, who was operating at an earlier time and admired her yeah. uh, and took courage from those achievements. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to tell these stories, mm. but I thought by fictionalizing them, I could give them broader appeal. Yeah. Um, audiences could walk a mile in their shoes. Yeah, it is um, that, that exercise of empathy really, isn't it? That, that, that uh, fiction. It would be lovely to hear you read even a short extract from one of the stories. Sure. Would you, Who would you like? Have you got a, are I you think interested in any of them in particular? Well, I'm, I'm given that we, we spent our holidays down in, in West Cork, it would be actually great to hear the, the, Somerville, and the Ross. Somerville and Ross one. So um, this is about Violet Martin, who used the nom de plume uh, Martin Ross. Yeah. And um, and you're actually doing your PhD on them. Yes, I am at Trinity. I'm in my second year and uh, lots more juggling. Uh, uh, and again, is that an example of, of reputations needing to be reclaimed in that we anything we knew about Somerville and Ross were those slightly kitschy uh, the Irish, Irish RM stories. stories, whereas they wrote perhaps one of the best um, novels about the 19th century in Ireland. Is this the real Charlotte? The real Charlotte. Um, I, I Which think I think I did read, but I, I again, I, I saw it referenced in your story and I was, I cannot actually remember. There's an amazing protagonist in it called Charlotte Mullen, who uh, is not particularly likable, but she's understandable. Uh, which is a great skill for a writer to achieve. Yeah. And um, why I was drawn to them is they were working writers and huge in their day, not really admired as much as they should be nowadays. I think that's an injustice. Mm -hmm. They insisted on being treated as professional writers, not dilettantes. They had one of the first agents, a London agent called... Oh, Pinker? Yes, Mr. Yeah. Pinker. They, I read their letters in Trinity College. They're always sending off their missives to Mr. Pinker, um, James Pinker. And uh, he was an enterprising journalist who set up one of the first literary agencies. And he had a who's who of a client list. He had um, Arnold Bennett. He had 
Um, who else did he have? He had D.H. Lawrence, no. he had James Joyce. Uh, Virginia Woolf called her dog Pinker, but didn't sign up with him. Um, I'm, and I'm trying to imagine how a, an agent might have extracted any money out of James Joyce. At no, any stage. I know. I'm sure he made. I'm sure he ended up um, sending money to James Joyce himself out of yeah. his own pocket. He was very successful ahead of his time. The idea of foreign rights and serialization rights, yeah. and um, Somerville and Ross had a long correspondence with him and quite a long relationship. Mm -hmm. um, Somerville was always attempting to sell him horses because she made a lot of her money from horse coping. Ah, she was okay. a very ju good judge of horse flesh. And they had extraordinary lands for, for, for Hunting. horses as well, didn't they? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And um, Martin, um, Violet Martin, uh, because she was in a lot of pain in later life, uh, used to write quite short letters um, and she called them her stand and deliver letters to Mr. Pinker because she didn't have so much time for the niceties. It was pretty much, aren't we due some of our royalties at the minute? I find them very entertaining. Yeah. Well, maybe you might read an extract from that story. Right, let me find a bit. How much would you like me to read? Maybe about three minutes worth. Uh, let me find a bit. One of the things I wanted to do with this story was show the interaction between, um, in this case, Martin, Violet Martin, and uh, the staff, mm. uh, because we know that they um, were very adept at dialect and um, made notes yeah. about dialect as they heard it contemporaneously. Yeah. And they would have um, encountered a lot of that with the servants, the very colourful Hiberno English that was spoken. So the importance of the writer's notebook and keeping a note oh, of everything. Oh, they did. They yeah. absolutely wrote everything down. Yeah. Um, we have evidence of that um, in, in their notebooks. Mm -hmm. And also they went to court hearings in Skibreen and um, they would write down accounts of court cases Great because source of, of amazing story. stories Absolutely. and the excuses that people were given uh, were giving at the time and um, uh, Sergeant Sullivan who was a young lawyer at that time he went on to represent Roger Casement in his trial for treason in England but at the time I, as a young writer he saw them in mm -hmm. Skibbereen in the uh, assizes there and he uh, talk, he wrote about it in his uh, autobiography seeing two young women scribbling away in court and wondering what they were doing. Very good. So let me find a part. Violet lit an Egyptian cigarette. To smoke was a new accomplishment and she was not yet proficient. Blowing out when she meant to suck in which caused coughing fits. Still she gloried in it because it seemed modern. Was that her mother's voice in the front hall already? She hadn't tackled any of her jobs. Some judicious fibbing would be required. Violet stubbed out her cigarette, slid a peppermint into her mouth and ran downstairs, pausing only to tap the barometer on the lower landing. Rain was its promise, as usual. Ah, Violet, I've just spoken to the chimney sweep who's drinking tea in the kitchen without a care in the world, as though his brushes can lie there cluttering up the backyard till doomsday. Weren't you supposed to deal with him? I didn't know he was here, Mama. I was attending to something else. I'll send for him right away. No need, I've given him his instructions, though I was depending on you to do it. There's only so much a woman of my age can be expected to accomplish. Sorry, Mama. Did everything go well with Father Fitzgerald? Mrs. Martin turned a bland face on her daughter. No, my dear, I haven't left yet. But wasn't Father Fitzgerald expecting you at ten to see about our picnic for the village children? He may expect all he likes. I will not be made to keep time like a clock, especially not by a man with a face as shiny as a pair of Sunday boots. She's a great character, Violet's mother. 
Yes, and I suppose the reason I did this interaction with mother and daughter was to show that uh, for Somerville and Ross, they really had to struggle to find the time to write. Their families didn't take their writing mm. all that seriously, even when they were quite successful. Mm -hmm. yeah, as well-born uh, young ladies, and then not so young ladies, but still the spinster, uh, daughters slash sisters in the household, they were expected to take on hostess and running the household duties and they were regarded as more important than scribbling. The squeaky door comes to mind uh, in Jane Austen's house in, in Hampshire. They point out the door that she would never allow to be oiled because she would write in private and under her knitting yes. and she needed the squeak of the door to alert her to the fact that somebody was coming and she'd put her writing away. And That's hide right. it under the so so you know women have always had to scribble in private and and um, and fitted in amongst other duties. Indeed, I mean I'm very lucky. There's just me at home and the cat Chekhov for long long hours all day um, before my husband comes home from work and brings a bit of the outside world into me. So do you have an, a plan now, or are you still in the that this this only came out a couple of months ago? So presumably not even that. It's only out. Yeah, just weeks ago. So there's a, a sort of a lengthy enough um, promotion which must take you away from, from new projects? Well, yes, but that's something you accept when a book comes out. It's a privilege to talk about it. And I keep other things going. I write a weekly column with the Irish Independent every Saturday, so mm -hmm. I always have that on the boil. Um, I'm researching at the moment for my PhD, Somerville and Ross. And um, there will be a Somerville and Ross novel in due course. Oh, very good. Uh, you know, touch wood and so forth. Um, part of me would like to do another collection like this because there were so many women that I wasn't able to include. Yeah. Uh, and I do think that there's a hunger to learn more about these women. But I'm not sure if I will because I've never done a follow up. Mm. I was asked to when I wrote my Titanic novel ship of dreams um, there, w there was certainly it was left so that I could have done a follow-up yeah. and indeed I could have done a follow-up with about Sisterland because I leave it deliberately vague at the end not in fact for the purposes of follow-up but to let readers make their own mm. minds up about what happens to my protagonists yeah. you know do they escape from Sisterland or are they captured and brought back and if yeah. so what happens if they escape what's beyond Sisterland like, if they're brought back, what's this new version of Sisterland like? And there's always, I suppose, the possibility of other other lies for the books, like through adaptation, for example? You know? Well, there has been a script, uh, a film script written of um, The House Where It Happened, but who knows yes. with film, you know. And it doesn't belong to me anymore yeah. once the book is written. It's out there. I, I never think of them really as my yeah. books once they're out there. People yeah. can take what they will from them. Yeah. On Friday, I've arranged to do a Skype conversation with an adult education class in Newry who are reading the book. Um, and it's on some curriculum, mm -hmm. I think, there. and. I said, sure, I'll do it. But you probably know more about the book than I do at this stage because yeah. I forget. I yeah. forget about the characters. You're focusing on the one that's there now. And also, I don't think I have the right to say definitively, well, this is what happened afterwards. People always want to know what about yeah. afterwards. I don't have the right to say that. Your yeah. version of events is as valid as yeah. mine. Yeah. If you believe this character is likely to have done X, Y and Z, well, that's as that's as likely as what I yeah. believe. And it's, it's, it's such a compliment to the writer if the reader feels an ownership over the character. I certainly it? don't have ownership over any of them, over any of the characters or any of the books. Yeah. In a way, like all writers, I'm that little girl in bed, uh, lying, trying to get to sleep, hearing the rain on the window pane and making up stories. Great. Well, that is bringing us full circle, really, in this conversation. So. Thank you very much for joining us, Martina. Best of luck with Truth and Dare. Thank you. Um, do you oh, the cover. Can I just tell you anything about oh, the cover? Oh, please do. Please do. So the cover is by uh, an artist called Gladys McCabe, who's from Randallstown in County Antrim. And it's a, sh a smaller version of uh, a painting that hangs on my sitting room wall. Mm. 
and I bought it at auction and I just felt it should be a book cover. So I tracked down her son, who's her heir, and uh, asked him for permission to use it. And he told me all about his mother, Gladys McCabe, who died earlier this year, uh, a few months short of her hundredth well, year. Well. She was 99 and three quarters. And I thought the more I heard about her, the more I thought this woman is amazing and should be one of my truth and dare women. She um, was operating in the 1950s and was a great supporter of other women. Um, she realised it was quite hard for women to be exhibited, women artists. Mm -hmm. So in 1957, she formed the Ulster Society of Women Artists to help advance their work. Wow. Uh, they showed in group exhibitions and she was always very insistent that the more successful artists should mentor and help the younger ones to get exhibited. So I thought she was perfect for Absolutely. my book. I've loved talking to Chris McCabe about his mother yeah. and uh, I love the fact that here she is part of my Truth and Dare Women. Absolutely and really striking, really, really striking. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And best of luck with, with, with Truth and Dare and all the other future projects. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you very much for, for watching us. Um, lovely to be here again. We'll be back sometime soon. Yes, I know That I'm just a dreamer I dream Cause it's the closest I'll ever get to you